Fiat's cheeky little 500 is a stylish city car that remains as appealing as ever in this rejuvenated guise. It's not been fundamentally changed, but then loyal buyers didn't really want it to be. These people will like the smarter look, the extra media options and the more individual feel. You can tell that Fiat knows its market. If ever a car has built its brand, it's this one, Fiat's 500. In fact, it's done so twice. First at its original launch back in 1957, and more recently with this modern era version. First launched in 2007 and significantly improved in mid-2015 to create the refreshed version that we're going to look at here. You could argue that the reason why this car was created at all lies with the existence of its closest rival, BMW's Mini. And when that car was relaunched for the modern era at the turn of the century, Fiat realised it could do the same thing by reinventing its classic 1950s Nuova Cinquecento model. So the Italian brand set to work, creating a new car that drew upon the fashionable cues of the old one and launching it just in time to take on the second generation Mini model. Since then, the Mini has progressed into a further model generation. The modern era version of this 500, though, has remained much as it was. Fiat's resources instead diverted in creating other larger five-door 500-derived models more suitable for small families, namely the 500L of 2012 and the 500X crossover of early 2015. Not that Turin has ignored this original little hatch version throughout its long production cycle. On the contrary, the brand has continually tried to improve it. Shortly after the original launch, we got the option of the open-topped 500C body style and frantic above branded hot hatch versions. Then in 2010, a clever 85 brake horsepower two-cylinder twin-air petrol engine was added to the range for extra pep and a little more economy, with a pokier 105 brake horsepower version of that unit added to the range in 2014. But more work was needed. By 2015, this Fiat was facing tougher competition, not only from the Mark III version of the Mini Hatch, but also from other style-orientated small cars like the Vauxhall Adam, the Citroen-derived DS3, and new generation versions of Smart's 4.2 and 4.4 models. Hence the thorough update that's created the revised version we're going to look at here. The look hasn't changed much. <laughs> why would it? That's the main reason why over one and a half million people have bought themselves this car. Minor tweaks, though, have brought the styling into line with other larger models in the wider 500 range. Plus, there's a little more efficiency, more scope for personalization, and wider availability of the Fiat Group's Uconnect infotainment technology. Would it all be enough? Let's find out. Get the look and feel of a car like this right, and you could argue that it hardly matters how it drives. That's certainly what Fiat has done here. For most potential owners, how this 500 model feels on the online configurator is more important than how it feels on the road. It's no surprise then to find that over 80% of potential owners happily ignore all the various quite sophisticated engines that the Italian brand offers for this car and stick instead with the entry-level 69 brake horsepower 1.2 litre four-cylinder petrol power plant that we're trying here. Does it matter that with just 102 newton metres of pulling power, this unit struggles to crest the slightest incline without a gear change or two? Or that 62 miles an hour from rest occupies around 13 seconds and the top speed can't reach 100 miles an hour? Probably not. This car will, after all, mainly be used around town, where such deficiencies will rarely be noticed. And with that in mind, quite a few owners will want to order this car with the optional but rather jerky Duologic gearbox, a uh, kind of manual transmission without the clutch that will save you all that left foot pumping in town. We'd suggest, though, that you don't automatically sign on the dotted line for the four-cylinder 1.2 model without at least trying Fiat's two-cylinder 0.9-litre twin-air technology. Like me, you might need a bit of persuading in this direction. After all, it does seem a little strange to be paying more for a smaller engine. 
will it really get you mini standards of performance? After all, a two-cylinder engine of this size, to my mind, is the kind of thing likely to generate little more power than the average sit-on lawnmower. Yet, here there are at least 85 braked horses on tap, sufficient to see 62 miles an hour blow by in 11 seconds on the way to an academic maximum of 107 miles an hour. On the plus side, though, the Twin Air soundtrack really suits the cheeky character of this car. Uh, putter putter thrum that seems to be exactly the kind of thing you would have heard from the 1957 original, nipping through the back streets of Naples. There's even a pleasing note of historical symmetry in that the original Fiat 500 from the 50s also had two-cylinder power, although back then the wheezy old unit in question generated just 17.5 brake horsepower. Today's twin air engine, as I've said, gives you considerably more and in the process generates nearly 50% more pulling power than you get from this base 1.2 litre unit. Although you'll need to be quick with the slick shifting high mounted gear lever to keep in the meat of it. This unit develops 145 newton metres of torque and on that subject, it's worth pointing out that you don't automatically get that full quoted amount unless you disengage an eco mode button that's provided on the dash. Now, when activated, this restricts the engine's output in the interest of efficiency to 120 newton meters in the case of the twin air unit, which can be a little bit disconcerting if you forget it's on and then suddenly need to dive for a gap in the traffic. I mentioned earlier that the twin air variant can offer you at least 85 braked horses because these days Fiat also allows you to specify a pokier 105 brake horsepower version of this power plant. And sure enough, the, that engine output puts this car right on par with its arch rival, the 102 brake horsepower Mini 1, and the performance is uh, comparable with that car too. In comparison with the Twin Air 85 brake horsepower unit, rest to 62 improves to 10 seconds dead en route to 117 miles an hour. That's if you press the provided sport button on this version, which transforms the TFT dash display screen that plusher models get into a turbo boost gauge, along with graphics to turn from white to red. Are there other engine options in this car? Well, yeah, a few, but they're rarely specified. A tiny number of buyers like the black pump fueled uh, torque of the 1.3 litre multi jet diesel variant, and the 500 model's very small male audience is the predominant market for the 1.4 T jet turbo petrol power plant that serves in the various hot hatcher bath models, offering 135, 140, 160, or even 190 brake horsepower. That Fiat has managed to make these Abarth variants brilliant fun to chuck about is really quite an achievement given that as a design the 500 is engineered around a fairly crude set of underpinnings. The chassis dates back to a previous generation Panda model launched well over a decade ago and comes with a suspension that allows low speed bumps to be felt and heard rather too often. Plus the steering of mainstream models offers uh, little feedback when you're pressing on across twistier routes. And through those turns, the softer setup of this fit means that you'll get more body roll than you would in rivals like the Mini Hatch or the Vauxhall Adam. Still, as I said at the beginning, none of this really matters to most potential buyers who can't look beyond the cute shape and the way that they're going to personalise the paintwork so it looks different when parked alongside the others at the gym. Those people will appreciate the dynamic efforts Fiat has made here, the improved refinement you'll notice at motorway speeds and the better brakes. And they'll like the light steering with its city option that lightens it even further so that you can twirl the car into the tightest spaces or test out the super tight 9.3 metre turning circle. It helps enormously here that the high driving position and the big windows make this car so easy to see out of and place on the road. It's urban friendly through and through. Through, you see. We would understand if you concluded that this new Fiat 500 looked pretty much the same as the old one. Nevertheless, Fiat insists that no fewer than 1,800 changes have been made in improving it. 
None of these have altered the dinky external dimensions. So at just 3.5 metres long, 1.6 metres wide and 1.5 metres high, this vehicle can still fit into spaces that even a Mini would have to avoid. If you choose the 500C variant rather than the fixed top model that we have here, then you get what amounts to a full-length canvas sunroof, which um, electrically retracts into a concertina bundle just above the boot. Most of the exterior styling tweaks that have been made can be found here at the front. The main round headlights adopt clever polyelliptical modules for improved nighttime vision and integrate the dipped beam headlamps and the turn signals. These lower lights just below deal with the main beam and LED daytime running light functions and they adopt the same circular profile so as to uh, graphically reproduce the zeros of the 500 name. The bonnet retains the same traditional uh, clamshell form and the trapezoidal nose gets more pronounced ribbing. While lower down, there's this three-dimensional grille that on a top model like this one features these chrome effect buttons. At the rear, this revised model has adopted what Fiat calls empty lights clusters, comprised of ring-shaped structures with body-coloured centres. Now, that's meant the need to relocate the fog light and the reversing light lower down into the edges of the redesigned bumper. In profile, the 500 model Faithful will notice new alloy wheel designs, but otherwise things are much as before. And that means you get the same lovable, short, curvy dimensions and this distinct crease flowing above the door handles from the front ring to the rear light cluster. Underneath, as before, this car is based on the ageing underpinnings of a previous model Fiat Panda, but potential owners rarely know this and rarely care if they do. Uh, every 500 model invites a high degree of personalisation via a myriad of colour and trim permutation options, but whatever you choose is sure to dovetail deliciously with the very well-judged blend of retro chic and clean contemporary design in the cabin. Here inside, delicious details are everywhere. The coloured fascia panels featuring iconic 500 badging and colour matched against the bodywork. As for this key change to this improved model, well, on a plush variant like this one, that's very obvious. This 5-inch Uconnect live infotainment display screen mounted high on the dashboard, right in your line of sight. This system, which is optional on lower spec models, allows Bluetooth hands-free calling, music streaming, voice recognition and an SMS reader that will read text messages to you. And via this setup, you can keep up with your friends on Facebook and Twitter, keep up with the news via Reuters, select from more than 35 million music tracks via Deezer and access over 100,000 global radio stations via TuneIn. Extra cost Uconnect system options also allow you to add DAB radio and navigation functionality if you want it. For a technophobe like me, though, it's a bit of an issue that you no longer get a CD player. Not much has changed in terms of getting comfortable. It's still disappointing to find that there's no reach adjustment on the steering wheel and that seat adjustment is only standard on a top spec model like this one. Still, the seat itself is slightly more comfortable thanks to ergonomic reshaping. Plus, you get smarter electric window switches and a redesigned steering wheel that features audio controls on plusher models. Through it, you glimpse the usual circular instrument cluster with analogue dials for speed and engine revs, plus digital secondary gauges. Opt for this top-spec lounge variant and you get the extra cost option of replacing the standard binnacle with this 7-inch TFT display that integrates with the functionality of the Uconnect dashboard infotainment screen. What else? Well, the car's certainly been well screwed together in the Polish factory, and you notice the upgraded materials now used. Although cheaper plastics are still evident the further down you look. In-cabin stowage remains well up to par for a city car. The revised centre console features cup holders and a relocated 12-volt socket. Plus, there's a small pop-out cubby on the driver's side of the centre console and the usual door bins and cup holders. The passenger seat cushion even tips forward to reveal an obmance compartment. And praise be, Fiat has at last provided a lid for the glove box. Other issues? Well, not too many. 
the seat itself is set rather high, something you particularly notice if you have a car with this one's fixed sunroof, a feature that eats into the headroom. The infotainment screen attracts reflections and the narrow pedal box might be a bit tight for those over-familiar with the offerings of Colonel Sanders. It's impossible to be irritated with this car for long, though. Mock Bakelite inserts around the stereo and the heater add to the charm, and everything about it is just so bright and cheery. Oh, time to move on to the rear seat. Given that the external dimensions of this car are so short, you won't be expecting to find much room here, and there isn't. Larger adults will find their heads brushing the roof, and they'll need to make full use of the elbow cutouts that are indented into the side panels. Most, though, will find the space provided just about sufficient for two people on short to medium journeys, and it'll probably be fine for kids. Out back, uh, the boot has a high lip and a narrow opening and remains one of the more compact offerings in the segment. Once you get your stuff in, though, the 185-litre space it provides is no smaller than an ordinary mainstream city car like Toyota's iGo would give you. If you're looking at stylized city car alternatives, well, yes, you would get about 10% more room in a Mini and about 50% more room in a Citroen DS3, but the capacity provided here is the same as you would get in a Smart 4.4 and 15 litres bigger than the space you get in a Vauxhall Adam. If you need to carry more, then you can push forward the rear bench, which split folds in all but the entry trim level. This frees up 550 litres. Bear in mind, though, if you opt for the 500c convertible version, that the luggage capacity figures fall slightly to 182 litres and 520 litres. Pricing for this three-door Fiat 500 occupies quite a wide span. Anything between around £11,000 to around £17,000 for mainstream versions, with a significant £2,500 model-for-model premium if you want the 500C version with its electric fabric folding roof. Here, though, we're focusing on the normal fixed-top three-door hatch. Bear in mind that at the bottom of the range, you'll be limited to the 69 brake horsepower 1.2 litre petrol engine that we're trying here. Entry level pop models only available with this unit. Progress up to mid range pop start trim, and the more efficient 85 brake horsepower twin air petrol engine becomes available at a premium of around £1,300 over the 1.2. Whichever of these two petrol power plants you favour, there's the £750 option of the Duologic clutchless gearbox if you want it. Is it worth stretching up to a twin air powered 500 model? Over 80% of buyers choose not to before usually going on to spend the money they saved on optional extras or personalised trim. But for the few who do want something more sophisticated, pokey and efficient under the bonnet and are prepared to pay upwards of £13,000 to get it, the twin air option has its appeal, although here we would be mindful of two facts. First, that in tweaked eco form, the base 1.2 can be nearly as economical. And second, that for not much more than twin air money, you could get yourself a 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel model that really would give you better day-to-day -day running cost returns. For all that, there is something very appealing about the twin air version of this car, particularly the sound it makes and the eager reviness that really suits the character of this Fiat. Do give it a try at the dealership before finalising your choice of model. If you decide you like this engine, then your salesperson will offer you the option of upgrading the unit into a Pokia 105 brake horsepower guise, thereby creating a very spirited little 500 indeed. Such a car might well, in fact, offer a more cost-effective alternative to the 500 above hot hatch models that many larger Fiat dealers will be able to tell you about. Now, these come only with a bigger four-cylinder 1.4-litre turbo petrol power plant and so inevitably offer more performance, but running costs are much higher and prices sit in the £15,000 to £20,000 bracket. Plus, insurance and maintenance will be more expensive. On to the value proposition represented by 500 model range pricing as a whole. Now you might think that the most obvious rival to this car is the Mini Hatch 3 door, but actually that is now a slightly bigger car. In its least powerful Mini 1 102 brake horsepower guys, it competes with the most powerful 500 twin air 105 brake horsepower model, undercutting the Fiat by a small amount. 
We'd argue that these days, a closer, more relevant rival to this stylized Italian icon can be found with Vauxhall's little Adam model. Like this Fiat, it's a three-door only design, plus it's comparably priced and almost endlessly personalizable. There are two issues for Vauxhall, though. First, that the engine the Adam provides are nothing like as efficient as those of this Fiat. And second, that if sales to date are any guide, the market seems to think that the 500 is still the cuter looking proposition of the pair. Are there other competitors that you could consider? Well, not many. Of course, there are any number of similarly sized conventional city cars you could look at as alternatives, most of them more cheaply priced than this one. There aren't really any rivals, though. For a typical Fiat 500 buyer, choosing, say, a Peugeot 108 or a Ford KA in preference to this car would be like choosing a Marks & Spencer handbag over a Prada one. There are, though, a couple of other manufacturers that recognise this and provide stylized city cars to suit. The Citroën-derived DS3 in its least expensive PureTech 82 guise is comparably priced to this Fiat and will give you more interior space but higher running costs. Otherwise, the only really relevant products to stack up against this car are the 4.2 and 4.4 models produced by the Mercedes-owned Smart brand. The 2C to 4.2 is probably just that little bit too small for a potential 500 buyer, but we reckon that the 4.4 is a close match and comes with the extra rear doors that you can't get with this model. Equalise equipment levels against this Fiat and it's comparably priced too, but does it have the sheer style of a 500? Many potential customers will think not. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Fiat 500 that you still really, really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Fiat has been with the standard spec. Well, excluding all the inevitable special editions you tend to get with a car like this, there are three main trim levels. Pop, Pop Star and Lounge, with an £875 premium necessary to upgrade yourself between each. Pop trim is only available to buyers wanting the base 1.2 litre petrol engine and includes, uh, well, the basics. That means things like daytime running lights, power windows and mirrors, remote central locking, a decent quality radio CD MP3 player with USB and aux in ports and a start and stop system to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. You also get a space saver spare wheel rather than the kind of awful tyre inflator kit that mini models will inflict upon you. Upgrade yourself to pop start trim and it all gets a bit nicer. At this level, you get 15-inch alloy wheels, powered and heated body-coloured door mirrors and the 50-50 split-folding rear bench that, rather meanly, pop trim makes you do without. Upgrade further to the top lounge spec that we're trying here and you also get chrome exterior trim, front fog lights, rear parking sensors and a fixed sunroof. Inside, there's a Uconnect 5-inch infotainment touchscreen with Bluetooth phone compatibility, plus a height-adjustable driver's seat and a leather-covered steering wheel with audio controls. On to options. If you haven't stretched to top lounge trim, then we'd recommend that you add in that Uconnect infotainment system I mentioned. On all models, there's the option of upgrading it with a DAB radio and a navigation setup, while lounge variant buyers can specify a larger 7-inch screen. Other options include a full leather interior, climate control, dark tinted glass, by xenon headlamps, an electrochromatic rear view mirror, a leather gear knob and chromed kick plates. If you have a car like this one with a fixed sunroof, then you can pay extra to have that feature electrically powered. And on a top lounge model like this one, we'd also want to take up the option of the 7-inch TFT instrument cluster. A full range of Mopar accessories includes things like uh, door mirror trims, distinctive side badges and vintage style wheel trims. And a tailgate rack is also available with two systems for transporting winter sports equipment, things like skis and snowboards. Where you're going to have most fun, though, is when it comes to specifying the exterior look of the car. To widen the options here, Fiat has introduced a range of body wrapping available as part of what it calls a second skin personalisation programme. Now, there are two main options here, the simplest of which applies to both 500 body styles and gives you a fashionable geometric pattern uh, along the belt line of the car. Larger second skin options apply only to the hardtop 500 model and cover the pillars and the roof, and in some cases, the bonnet and the tailgate as well. Five patterns are offered. 
ethnic, which is a geometric pattern, lord, that's classic tartan, navy, that's a nautical pattern, camouflage for the fashionable military look, and comics, a pop decoration finish that works in combination with two-colour paintwork. If you don't want to go quite as far as sticking body wrappings all over your car, then your dealer will be happy to offer you a whole range of stripes and sticker sets with a special chequered sticker design for the roof if you want it. Uh, having a black painted roof is another option. There's a choice of personalised ignition keys and you might want to look at things like uh, chromed bonnet trim, larger 16 inch alloy wheels, a branded side rubbing strip and red brake calipers before you finish off the whole thing with your choice from what is now a much wider body colour palette offering a choice of metallic, tri-coat or pastel paint finishes. Uh, on to safety. Now you don't get any of the latest electronic camera based features that are now creeping onto rival models but all the basics are very much in evidence. So even the cheapest trim level will give you twin front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag. There's ESC stability control plus anti-lock brakes with HBA, hydraulic brake assistance, to help in panic stops. And those will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. On top of that, uh, you get Fiat's ASR and MSR traction control systems, uh, tyre pressure monitoring and a hill holder clutch to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. It all justifies this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test rating. At first glance, Fiat's figures make a compelling case for the twin-air petrol 500 model variants. Compared to a version of this car using the conventional entry-level 1.2-litre four-cylinder petrol unit that we're trying here, two-cylinder twin-air motoring seems to offer you a cake-and-eat-it scenario. After all, paying the extra to have this pokier engine in its volume 85 brake horsepower form gets you 23% more power from a variant that delivers a 15% reduction in uh, fuel consumption and emissions. That sounds great, doesn't it? And sure enough, the official figures suggest that an 85 brake horsepower 500 twin air model delivers 74.3 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 90 grams per kilometre of CO2. And those figures remain identical if you choose the Duologic clutchless version. And there's not even much of an efficiency downside in going for the 105 brake horsepower model. Here you're looking at 67.3 miles per gallon and 99 grams per kilometre of CO2. We're not so sure that the uh, case is as open and shut as that when it comes to choosing the right 500 model engine for you though. In fact, the more time we spent with this base 1.2 litre variant, the more we can understand why over 80% of buyers choose this unit. For one thing, a lot of these people know that the quoted figures for the twin air versions are very difficult to achieve in the real world. In fact, they're impossible to achieve unless you drive a 500 twin air model with its eco mode permanently activated. Almost nobody does this because the eco feature significantly limits the extra pulling power that would have prompted you to pay extra for the twin air model in the first place. On top of that, the four-cylinder 1.2 has been getting progressively more class competitive when it comes to efficiency, able to deliver 60.1 miles per gallon in this latest Euro 6 guise, or 62.8 miles per gallon when mated to the Duologic clutchless gearbox. The CO2 figures aren't bad either, 110 grams per kilometre with a normal stick shift or 105 grams per kilometre in duologic form. Plus, Fiat is also offering an eco version that can cut your CO2 to just 99 grams per kilometre thanks to minor exterior and mechanical revisions. Now, that's not very far off the kind of running costs you'd expect to get from the 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel version of this car. The 1.4-litre T-Jet petrol turbo or bath hot hatch models, of course, cost a lot more to run. The best of these is the 140 brake horsepower model, which manages 47.1 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 139 grams per kilometre of CO2. I should point out that there's no difference in running costs between the standard fixed top 500 models and the 500C convertible variants. And all 500s are fitted with a stop and start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. 
as a help owners get somewhere close to the quoted returns on a regular basis all models get a gear change indicator and if you've a car fitted with a Uconnect infotainment touchscreen then you can go further by downloading a Uconnect live app that will deliver access to Fiat's EcoDrive system. Now this assesses your driving style in real time and gives you tips to improve it that could improve fuel consumption by up to 16%. The Uconnect Live app can also give you service deadline memos and an interactive owner handbook to manage car maintenance. On the subject of servicing, well, costs for this can vary quite a bit depending on the engine that you choose, but all 500 models will need a garage visit every 18,000 miles or two years. There's the option of an annual service if your car covers less than 9,000 miles a year, and if that's likely to apply to you, then we'd suggest you stick to that recommendation, if only for an oil change. What else? Uh, well, this car should certainly be cheap to insure. For this base petrol 1.2, you're rated at groups between 7 and 11. For the Twin Air 85 brake horsepower, you'll be rated between groups 11 and 15. And for the Twin Air 105 brake horsepower variant, you'll be rated between groups 14 and 15. The Abarth models are rated between groups 26 and 29. Residual values are better than you might expect them to be on a small, affordable Fiat, if not quite as good as you get from a rival Mini. Expect most 500 variants to hold around 40% of their value after three years, provided that you don't go too mad with options, of course. Finally, a word about warranties. Uh, you get two years of manufacturer cover with this car, plus a further year from the dealer. Plus, there's no mileage limitation, which makes this Fiat deal better than the restricted three-year 60,000-mile package you get with rival Mini Hatch and DS3 models. There's also a year of roadside assistance, um, a reasonable three-year paintwork warranty, and an eight-year anti-perforation guarantee. To be honest, Fiat hasn't needed to do a whole lot to retain this 500 model's popularity. It still looks great, it's always been fun to drive, and providing that the pricing doesn't get too ambitious, the market remains there for it. As for this updated version, well, issues like restrictions in boot space and rear seat accommodation remain, but the things the brand could improve without a major redesign have been usefully updated. As a result, it's now a more modern-feeling product. As importantly, it's a more personalisable one too, thanks to the Second Skin Individualisation Programme. And no other city car is now more media savvy, thanks to the clever Uconnect infotainment systems that transform the interior. Of course, not everyone's priorities lie in Facebooking their friends on the way to eat designer sushi. So for everyone else, the greater refinement will be welcome, especially when applied to the twin-air two-cylinder petrol engine that remains a key part of this Fiat's appeal. The sound and the eager response to this unit suit the car, and though the quoted fuel and CO2 returns are difficult to achieve in real-world motoring, it certainly makes the 500 a very cheap thing to run indeed. This power plant's also got quite a bit of pep if you're able to stretch to it in pokier 105 brake horsepower form. In summary then, this car remains as likeable as ever. Choosing a fashionable little runabout can often be a risk. Here though is when you can enjoy without a worry.